Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today we are talking about bedtimes. We did a podcast about making morning routines easier. We'll link to that in the show notes in case you didn't catch it, but we thought it would be great. Actually, it was Corey's idea that we should do one about making bedtime routines easier because we know that those are two of the really tough spots that we all face as parents, two of those things that unfortunately we have to do every day. Okay, just one quick thing. If you would like a cheat sheet of all of the tips and best practices that Corey and I are going to be talking about for bedtimes, you can go to sarahrosensweet.com slash bedtimes. And also, if you are having trouble uh, self-regulating, which is our first big idea of peaceful parenting, and you would like some support around that, I have a free course called How to Stop Yelling at Your Kids. And you can find that at sarahrosensweet.com slash yelling. All right, let's dive in. Uh, I saw this funny thing once on Facebook that said it's not fair that the people who want to go to bed have to put to bed the people who don't want to go to bed. And I think that and that really encompasses the that nighttime struggle that a lot of parents have. So I do have a guest today, and that is Corey, who is one of my coaches and a wonderful person. Corey, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Corey. And as Sarah said, I'm one of her coaches. I've been working with Sarah for a while now, for I think it's over two years. And I started as a client and then I've been helping her with a lot of behind the scenes things. And this summer, Sarah trained me as one of the coaches. So I'm very excited to be talking to all of you today. Yeah, it's great. People will get a chance to know you too, because it's always an option to work with you as well as working with me. Okay, so we thought that we would start with mindset. Corey and I have been brainstorming for a couple of days about sort of what we wanted to talk about today. So Corey, why don't you start with what some of your top mindset tips that you that you think are helpful. You're still in the thick of bedtime. I'm actually in that. I was thinking about this this morning. My daughter often tucks me in now. <laughs> so I go to bed. I often go to bed earlier than than my kids do. So I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm on the other side. So you're still in the thick of it. Because how old are your kids? So I have Big C who just turned seven, and then I have Little C who's four and a half. So we are definitely still in the thick of bedtime. Yeah. Although I want to start by offering hope to everyone because I have noticed lately that it has gotten a lot easier. So I think that's a very good way to start off mindset is just reminding yourselves that it will not be hard for them. Yeah. You know, as your kids get older, they do find bedtime easier. So you just have to keep reminding yourself when you're in the thick of struggling to get them to go to bed, that this is just a temporary time and one day they actually might like going to sleep or tuck you in yeah. like they're doing with you now. Yeah, I think it's really tough because when we are in the thick of it, it feels like it's going to last forever. I actually have a sweet story that is one of my favorite stories about my kids. You know, Asa, my middle son, he used to like as he was getting older, he he could get ready pretty much by himself, but he would get in bed and then he would shout, "Mama, tuck in, tuck in." And then I would come and tuck him in. And one day I realized it's been a few days since he's called me. And it was really sad. I was like, oh my God, like I missed the last tuck in. Like I didn't even know that it was happening. And so I said to him, he was probably around 10 at the time. I said, Asa, I think I missed your last tuck in. Like I realized you haven't been calling me for tuck ins anymore. And he kind of shrugged, like he was 10, whatever. He couldn't, you know, I didn't mean much to him. But then that night he called me and he was like, mama, mama, tuck in. And I went in and he said, this is the last one. That just, it honestly makes me so me too. Up hearing that. <laughs> He's <laughs> such a sweetheart, but it was really like, you like you don't know, you don't realize while it's happening that it is getting easier. I think that would be, I think talking about this in terms of my son, Big C would, would be really helpful too, because with him, sleep has been a journey and we've gone through all the stages of, it began with, 
I'd have to, you know, wrestle him to bed, basically. It was so hard to get him to go to sleep. And then all of a sudden, it was where he would just go to sleep with me laying beside him. And then suddenly, he was okay if I was sitting up beside him. And then all of a sudden, one day, he was cool with me, just like sitting on the floor near him. And now I find that he's just going to bed by himself. And I actually had a moment where I have to like go in and make a point of like giving him a hug and kiss because he's, he's okay now. So I never would have thought well, that's, that that would be possible. That shows that you've supported him so well. Like, you know, we always talk, people always worry that peaceful parenting is like too much coddling or like, you know, how, how will they ever learn to be independent if we're supporting them so much? And we, you know, as we always teach Corey, like kids, they, their independence blossoms out of knowing that their needs are being met and that they have that connection with us and, you know, that they have that nurturing. And that's a perfect example of that. Like you supported him so much at bedtime and now he's much more independent. Yeah. So some of the mindset things that have gotten us to that (laughs) is I really embrace the idea that you taught me that it's okay to help. So I think a lot of the stress comes from this idea. It's you always talk about the expectation gap where you expect them to be able to just like march upstairs and like have a bath or shower and magically get themselves in pajamas and into bed, right? Yeah, like you can say, okay, go get ready for bed, and and then you just have to go up and give them a hug and kiss, and they're already teeth brushing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe some kids are like that, but that's generally not our people. We generally, you know, those those, those easier kids. Those probably aren't the people who are desperate for help with the bedtime routine. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. They might not be listening to the podcast, (laughs) but my children are definitely not those children. So I really had to have the mindset that this is hard for them because it's a separation. It's them having to say goodbye to me for the night and that's hard. So I needed to take every opportunity I could to connect to them and make them feel loved and just keep thinking that this is an opportunity to nurture them and make them feel connected, which will make the parting easier. So I think up until very recently, and even still sometimes, I fully dress both my children in their pajamas. And I just, we look at each other and and we connect deeply to each other. And I just don't even expect them to be able to put on their pajamas by themselves. And, you know, now a lot of times both of them will do it themselves. But when they need to, I just do it and I don't worry about it. Well, it's always easier, I think. I mean, in terms of that mindset shift with the expectations, I think just in general, if you expect, okay, this is going to take a long time. It's not going to be like 15 minutes and we're going to be out of there. But you you might be pleasantly surprised, but it's always it's always easier if you expect that you're going to have to help a lot, that it is going to take a long time and then you're not as frustrated, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And just like building in this like long chunk of time, knowing that like this is going to go at a snail's pace. So I really need to get up there early with them. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think you also mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit more about connection and separation, but I think knowing that, as I said in the beginning, like they don't want to go to bed right? Like they, they experience that as a separation from us. They would, their agenda is not our agenda. They'd much rather just stay up all night, keep playing, being with us. And so just knowing that, that it's hard for them. And that I think that helps us a lot too, just having that empathy. Well, and I, I know we were something that we need to talk about too, is the big thing that helps me with my mindset is that I have to do things that make me in a good place before even attempting bedtime. Yeah, I mentioned what are some of the things that you do to kind of set yourself up to be in a better space? So a big thing that I did, especially during the pandemic and weekends, like when my kids are around me a lot, I need to make sure that I like leave the house and do some sort of exercise before bedtime so that I'm, you know, in a much better place to then connect with them and have the energy to deal with that. So throughout the entire pandemic and now mostly on weekends, I always go for a walk with my dog right after dinner so that, you know, it's just like a 30 minute power walk. And then I come in the door and I feel much more prepared to get through the whole bedtime routine. Nice. Um, The other thing that I do is I always have a hot drink for myself. So what the drink is depends on how much I'm dreading bedtime that night. (laughs) (laughs) So often it's like, I'll have, I'll have a tea, but over the holidays, um, we were dealing with a lot of sickness and and we were all together a lot. So I had hot chocolate like every night during, during bedtime routine. And I had it in my travel mug. So it stayed hot for like however long the whole process took. Nice. Nice. So you're really, you're doing some self-care. 
you know, so that you so that you have res higher resources or more resources at your disposal. And it might be hard for people if they don't have a partner, but their partner's not around at bedtime. But maybe they could think of, you know, people could brainstorm and think of something that they could do, even just a five minute, you know, go in the bathroom and have five minutes themselves if they can. Yes. So I do a lot of solo bedtime because my husband works a really intense work schedule. And so I find if, if that's the case, I try and really, I've talked about this before, use strategic screen time. So if, if I know that he is not going to be with me for bedtime, I'm alone, I will do something around maybe just before dinner. I will use screen time then so that I know my kids are fully occupied and do exercise inside the house so that I've at least gotten that, you know, an hour or two before the whole bedtime thing is going to happen. And that's been really key for me. All right. That's, Recharge. You know. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, let's move on. Let's like move on to sort of getting the best stuff the best start of the routine. And one thing that I think sometimes parents don't know about is that sometimes kids, we, we they stay up too late and they get overtired and they don't seem tired. A gentleman I know who's a grandfather in Australia, he calls it, he said he and his wife used to call it, you've got to catch them before they go over the falls. And I love that. I love that image. Like they're, you know, you're heading towards the rapids or towards the waterfall and you got to catch them before they go over the falls. And that's because, you know, when we, when our bodies are awake for longer than, than they think they should be, it registers as an emergency in our bodies and our bodies produce like, like that our bodies think, oh, there must be some reason why we're awake when we're really tired. Like we're, you have a long march to like get away from the floods or something like that. And so our bodies produce cortisol and adrenaline. And some kids actually can get addicted to that and will like avoid, you know, do a lot of like heel dragging and avoid getting ready for bed because they actually can get kind of a hit. It feels good, you know, when you get kind of punchy when you're tired. So that's one thing to watch out for is really, you know, look up the sleep needs for you can look online for the sleep needs for your child and make sure that you're starting early enough. And a good clue, we did talk about this in our morning routines, but if you have to wake your child up, in the morning, it's generally a sign that they're not going to bed early enough. And even if they don't seem tired, it could be this thing where they're actually overtired. So that's a, a place to start is like looking at what your bedtime, what your bedtime is, and if you're starting early enough, and if you're, as you said before, allowing that time so that you're not feeling stressed and pressured. And I know it can be hard because some people are, you know, daycare pickup and then dinner and there's not much time. But as you said, you can use that time as connection, which I think is really important. And also this may be obvious, but I'm just going to say it again, you know, not screens right before bedtime that often is it can make kids have a hard time falling asleep and just kind of having like a quieter evening for a wind down. Is there anything you want to add to that part of the night? Yeah, I know we try and never have screens later than after like five o'clock. My kids do go to bed pretty early because they are, as you know, Sarah, my kids have always gotten up really, really early. You know, Corey, Corey's never... always sending me messages at 6 a.m. and I don't see them for a few hours after when I wake up. <laughs> I have never woken my children up. They are just, yeah, so we have to get them to bed pretty early. So we have a cutoff at five o'clock because my youngest is going to sleep at seven. So that's what we try and do. However, as counterintuitive as this might sound, my kids also need really like a really intense, like 10 minutes of high energy roughhousing, or they cannot settle down at all for bed. So with my oldest, when he was little, we did something so simple called run touch wall and he would literally run up and down the hallway in our teeny tiny house, hitting the wall on each side. And then after that, he was like, cool, I can I can get ready for bed now. But we've always had to incorporate intense roughhousing. We have big pillow fights. We race up the stairs. So all sorts of different, like really physical things. Our occupational therapist taught us to do, you know, the wheelbarrow race? Yeah. To do that up the stairs wow. to well, get ready fun. for bed at night. That's fun. And that's, that's playful too, to move them through the schedule, which we're going to touch on more. Yeah. My kids did this thing. I don't know why we, how we came up with the name of it, but it was called skills and you have to, you have to spell <laughs> it with a Z on the end, right? Skills with a Z. And we would sit on the couch and my, and this was, I think my daughter was a baby when we were doing this, but my boys were probably like three and six and they would do like leaps and kicks and turns and like do all of these moves. And like they, we'd say, they'd say, going to show you our skills. So we'd say, okay, time to show us your skills. And we'd sit there. And so it was not exactly roughhousing because we weren't involved, but they were still getting out 
all of their energy. And I think, I think, you know, there are two reasons, at least maybe three reasons why this is important. And I love that you brought it up because a lot of times I, and I just said, wind down early in the night, right? So this is a little bit, as you said, counterintuitive, but the rough housing serves three purposes. One, getting out that energy from the end of the day. The other is kids often have a full backpack and that helps stops them from being able to fall asleep sometimes. If you know the pressures and the stresses and big feelings from the day haven't been processed, it can be hard to fall asleep. And so they're laughing, that empties that backpack, right? And then also the connection piece. It's another way to connect at the end of the day is through the rough housing. So, you know, I I haven't heard specifically that it doesn't work for some families. I imagine there are some kids out there that rough housing at the end of the day is a bad idea, but I I think it's worth a try for everyone. If you're not already doing that, if you are having difficulty at bedtime, give it a try. And when I say try it, try it more than once, try it a couple of times, see if it works for you. Because as you said, it's counterintuitive, but we both know through our own experience and through coaching that it really does help a lot of families to put in that rough housing piece before bed. And there's something about it too, that helps my mood. Like I've always found it really hard to be like, okay, you must schedule in rough housing because it's just, then it feels like another thing on your to-do list. Mm -hmm. But as we've sort of, you know, just did it in ways that work for us. So for my husband, we'd love to have a big pillow fight with them. That doesn't work for me, Mm -hmm. but doing fun things like the wheelbarrow, up the stairs and stuff does. And I get laughing with them. And that helps me actually feel in a better mood too. So it's not just for the kids. Like once you really get laughing with them, it makes you all feel better. That's a great point. I love that. Okay. Well, let's move on to our next big idea that we want to talk about, which is having a list of the things that are part of your routine. I know you do this, we did this, and it's really important for it to be a short list because sometimes, you know, I've seen people with their lists and they're like, you know, 12 things to do before bed, too overwhelming, too much. But our list was, you can, I would love you to share yours too, but ours was brush teeth, last pee and jammies. So we had- (laughs) That's ours too. That's yours too? Okay. Okay. I'm interjecting here. Hopefully this isn't too awkward because we're going to put this in after Corey and I finish recording. We both went, oh my gosh, we forgot to talk about the bedtime snack. So I'm just popping in here with a little, well, it's not a PS because it's not coming at the end, but we both talked about how a bedtime snack can be an important part of the bedtime routine, especially if your kid didn't eat that much dinner. When my kids were little, I always offered them a snack before we started the whole brush teeth jammies routine. And it's, I think it's really important to offer something that's nothing too exciting because you don't want them to hold off on eating dinner because they know they're going to get an exciting bedtime snack. But something that's either leftover dinner, it's dinner that they didn't finish is, is one possibility or something that's, you know, what I did was something that was a little bit of protein and a carb. So often my kids might have some not sweet cereal with some milk or yogurt. Another idea might be, you know, banana with peanut butter, something like that. But you might think about offering that bedtime snack and just really putting it as part of the routine. I started doing that because my oldest son, every time he would get up in bed and I would I would come down, I would hear, I'm hungry, I need some cereal. And I remember I was venting to my dad about it one day and he said, why not just give him cereal before he goes to bed? And I was like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. So that that's how it became part of our bedtime snack. So that's just something that you might want to think about, which can save you from the, but I'm hungry when you've got everyone tucked in. Okay, back to the conversation with me and Corey. So we had three things and our kids got into the habit of saying like, okay, I'm three three for three when they didn't need quite as much support and they could do those things by themselves. We'd say, where are you on the list? Which is also important. We talked about this in the morning routine that we're not taking responsibility and nagging, but we can, as if they know what the list is, you can make a list, you can, you know, put, you could make it together and put it up on your wall somewhere or something. You could get fancy if you want and move clothespins to the spot when you're when you've done it or you can just have it in your mind which is what we did but we would just say okay where are you on your list and they'd say I'm two for three or I'm only one for three or then finally I'm three for three so anything that anything you do that's different than that so that's basically what we do as well I drew little pictures I am not a talented artist so they're pretty hilarious but I drew three different cue cards and stuck them up to the wall and just had like a picture of like jammies, a toothbrush and a little toilet. (laughs) And so for my older child, he never took to it. 
But for my four-year-old, he always goes up to it and is like points at it and then goes in and does that thing. Normally he points at it and then grabs me and I have to do that thing with him. But like he does love looking at it. So that's like where I like the idea. We do have to try different things for different kids because it might not work for yeah, all of them. Yeah, totally. One thing you and I talked about before too, which comes up a lot in coaching, is a lot of people have this idea of the, there's this North American bedtime routine that includes a bath. And a lot of people are like struggling to get the bath in every day, even if, you know, their kids, maybe they don't have time or maybe their kids are like, I don't want to take a bath. Take this as your permission slip. You do not have to give your child a bath every day. If it's summer and they've got like sand and sunscreen and, you know, sweat, okay, maybe, maybe a bath every day might be necessary, but at least here in the, in the winter when they're not you know, super active. It's actually probably better for their skin now that I think about it, not to have a bath every day. Uh, We used to do what we called cracks and crevices, where we would take a washcloth and like just, you know, do armpits and and toes and bum kind of in that order with a washcloth. So you really don't have to have a bath every day. Well, and especially for our listeners out there who have neurodivergent children, I mean, baths. Like we, the bath is actually which really clued us into starting to learn about my son being neurodivergent because it was, it was like torture to him. And so we couldn't fathom the idea of having to do this every night. It just set everyone on edge. So we only do it twice a week, most weeks. Like you said, unless there's we did, some sort yeah, of we did Wednesday and Sunday. I had to make the days for myself so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> so we did That's what we Wednesday, do too. Wednesday and Sunday baths. <laughs> Yeah, otherwise we'd be like, has it been a week? Yeah. Like we need to make sure we've done this. Totally. So yes, yeah, so we definitely have to have like two days. And the one thing we learned too on Sundays is sometimes we'll do it earlier in the day. Like we might even do it, you know, in the middle of the day because um, we really need to limit the amount of transitions. If there's too many transitions during bedtime, that's when, especially my older child just shuts down. He just can't deal if it's like, constantly and when you think about a bath that's so many transitions because you have to get out of clothes and into water and then all these things happening in the water so and it's a lot of sensory giving it's a sensory overload too right yes yeah I I think I think it's in the book raising your spirited child she talks about how also for spirited kids whether they're neurodivergent or not it can be too much stimulation at bedtime. So she suggests taking a bath at a different time of the day if it's if it's too much for for your child to do it at bedtime. And then also there's not a rush because I remember I remember actually as a child not wanting to get into the bath and then not wanting to get out. And that was the same for my kids like they didn't want to get in but then they didn't want to get out. So if you do it at a different time of the day, they can play in there for a lot longer. Yes, that's definitely what we found too. I also this came up the other day in our membership. I don't know if you were on that office hours or not, but someone was wondering they were struggling at bedtime and they were saying, like, I don't know what to do because I feel like I can't say if there's not enough time, you know, if we don't get going, we're not gonna have time for stories. And I, I was like, Well, wait, why can't you say that? And she said, Well, isn't that a threat? Like, aren't we not supposed to use threats? And so I wanted to talk about that briefly because it is okay to say, if we don't get moving, we are not going to have time to read three stories, or we only have time to read one story, or we might not have time for any stories at all. And it, that's just reality of life. Like, you know, kids do need to learn that that there are, no, I was going to say consequences, and I don't mean consequences as a punishment, but like, if you don't do certain things in a certain amount of time, then you don't have time for other things. And that's just the reality of life. And I think what doesn't make that a threat is if we are... It's our, it's our frame of mind when we say that, right? If we're angry and frustrated and, you know, if you don't get ready right now, no stories, that's definitely a threat. And that's like using fear to motivate kids. But if we're, if we're, you know, relatively regulated and we're just like looking at our watch, like, okay, really it is time to get going. And the reality of the situation is if we don't hurry up, we're not going to have time for stories. That's not a threat. Yeah, that's so true. And I think it's important to say that because I have to check that with myself all the time. I have to really like take a deep breath and then say that statement and really make sure I'm saying it from a place of we really have legitimately run out of time. Mm -hmm. 
And it's so easy to have that tone be off at that time. Totally. Yeah. So that's what we always want to check, right? Whether it's a limit or a consequence is our tone and our intent. Is our tone kind and compassionate? Is our intent just to, you know, set the limit or is our intent to scare them or make them feel bad? So that's just a, you know, a good thing to check in with yourself. If you do find yourself saying, if you don't get ready right now, we're not going to have time for X, Y, Z. So yeah, I think just, just consider that, you know, it's okay. Consider that your permission slip, another one. It's okay to say that, that it, that that's just the reality of life. We have time constraints. The last thing I want to say about the list is I remember you saying this once, I think it was in one of your free workshops and I've stolen it. And it's my favorite thing to say is we need to make the bedroom beddable. Yes. Is that how you said it? Yeah. Yeah. So beddable. I love that you brought that up. I totally forgot about that. So that just meant like a minimum level of tidying up so that there was a path from the bed to the door in case anyone had to get up in the night or we had to go to them. My kids were Lego fanatics. So we didn't, my husband and I did not want to be stepping on Lego in the middle of the night. So part of our night routine was we have to make the room beddable. And literally it just meant clearing a path. Like it wasn't like a big cleanup, but like, is it beddable? And okay, it's beddable. That's a, that's part of the nighttime routine. Our family is also Lego fanatics. And yes, we always do this. And this is something I do for my children because I know by the time we get to that point, they do not have the capacity to clean up. So while we're all in the room, my husband and I just start kind of clearing that path, moving the Lego over to make sure that no one's getting a foot spur on the way to yeah. from the bed. Yeah. Oh, it's really fun talking about this because it's just like, as I said, you know, my youngest is. 15 and it's been a long time since I've been doing these nighttime routines and and I can look back at it fondly now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So one thing that we we touched on a little bit, but let's talk about it more. And I would love, I love all of your ideas around this. I think this is one of your strengths as a parent is using play to move through the schedule. We talk about that a lot, you know, finding win-win solutions, just, you know, in general in peaceful parenting, especially I think at, at times when our kids are not we're not on the same page, we don't have the same agenda, play can be just such a great way to get cooperation. So what are some of the things that you do to, to use play to, to move through the nighttime schedule? So this is my absolute favorite part of parenting. <laughs> you're, you're like a this drama, is... you're like a drama person, right? So like you, you, like some of us might not, don't, don't compare yourself to Corey, but like take some cues from her, but don't feel bad if you're not as good at this as Corey is. I know I wasn't. Okay, well, I'm going to make this easy for you. So I'm going to say the two versions of this. There's the Corey dramatic version. And then there's my husband, who's an engineer version. Okay. <laughs> but we've each found our own way to do this. So my husband started something when we were downstairs. And this is something he always does with the kids. I don't know where he got this. But one day he just yelled at everyone, the last one upstairs is a rotten egg. And every child, <laughs> the dog, everyone just ran upstairs at top speed. And of course, I was the rotten egg. And then the children died laughing because they thought it was great that that was me. So we always make sure that when we do that, that it's myself or my husband. It's never one of the children right, yeah. that is the rotten egg. Yeah. <laughs> Important. <laughs> so that works for him because he doesn't have to do anything fancy or like get really dramatic. But I am a drama person and I love getting into like characters and doing pretend play with my children. So I often do stuff like I'll pretend to be a bus driver on the way up the stairs I'm a dental hygienist when I'm brushing their teeth. I do different voices. Like the whole thing can get very silly. I'm actually not great at doing this when my husband is around. I'm best when it's just me and the children and I can really no just audience. Do yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's a big thing. Yeah. And so you can, you know, you can use your kids' interests. Like, you know, one of my kids was really into monkeys. So anything having to do with monkeys, you could get them on board to play. And so whatever they're interested, if they're in pop, interested in Paw Patrol, I don't know the characters, but like, or Bluey or whatever, you can pretend to be the characters from their favorite show or their favorite, you know, theme. Like if you're, I, I, I know one client I had, their kid loved construction vehicles. So they pretended, what kind of construction vehicle are you going up the stairs and like, how would a digger go up the stairs or how would a, you know, steamroller or whatever the things were. So just really using your kids' interests to inject some play into 
that that nighttime routine. I know the teeth brushing thing, we had we had a story that I would tell and I would only tell this one story when they were getting their teeth brushed. They would always ask me for it at other times of the day and I was like, nope, gotta wait until we brush teeth. And it was about Mr. Dirt. And I don't know how I thought of this, but like probably from the Mr. Man books, but Mr. Dirt would find their way, find his way into their mouth during the day. And then when I was brushing their teeth, we had to brush out Mr. Dirt. And Mr. Dirt would always like, you know, hop out. We'd brush him out. He'd hop out. Maybe he'd hide in their backpack. And then when they went to school and they opened up their backpack, Mr. Dirt would hop back into their mouth. And there would be all these adventures of Mr. Dirt and what he did when he was out of their mouth and then how he got back in. I was visiting my sister in June and she has a five-year-old and I was brushing her teeth and I said, I'll tell you the Mr. Dirt story, but it kind of freaked her out. <laughs> like without the context, I guess she was like, wait, what? There's like a, a guy that goes in my mouth during the day. I'm like, no, 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 it's just pretend. <laughs> she was, she was a little like, hmm, I don't know about this. So, you know, find something that works for your kids. But I do recommend that something you do only at that time, have some sort of ritual like that. Well, and something that really worked for my husband, because he's not going to pretend to be a dental hygienist. That's just not for him. But he he would always, we'd take a little visual timer and we'd set, we figured out what was a reasonable amount of time. So when they were really little, it was like eight minutes. Now it could be like five or four minutes. And it's like, let's race to beat the timer. So it's not about like, you don't get anything if we're not done or any sort of threat. It's just like, this is the timer. Let's race and we'll get through everything as fast as possible. And like, they're running to get their jammies on and they're brushing their teeth. And so that was something that was playful, but it didn't involve any sort of acting imagination. (laughs) And also you could do something like put on a song, you know, each person chooses, you know, maybe you've got two songs to make it long enough. Each person chooses a song and you put those on and you, you know, dance your way through the routine or try to do it before the song ends. Another idea with racing is, you know, maybe one parent's doing the dishes and the kids are getting ready for bed. You could say like, can we beat, you know, can we beat dad? Dad's doing the dishes. Let's beat, see if we can beat dad and get ready for bed before he finishes the dishes. I don't ever recommend that you have the kids race each other because that can set up a sibling rivalry dynamic or or worsen the relationship. But if you can set up something where kids are working together to beat you or, you know, maybe you're getting ready for bed too. And let's see who can get ready for bed first. So that's a fun way to do it. Also having that race or race against the clock, as you mentioned. And going back to the dance party, that is my single best recommendation for parents who are doing bedtime by themselves. So that is my favorite way when I'm alone, I I bring like a little portable speaker and I put on a song that we all love and we all just dance and go through the schedule and it keeps everybody happy. And it also makes me feel like, I don't know, like I'm having fun instead of just being alone with this job that can be really daunting. Yeah, totally. Again, to the mindset thing, right? Like trying to find ways to make it fun for ourselves when it is something that's hard and we have to do it every darn day. Okay, let's talk about the separation piece. That's something we've touched on a couple of times. I know my my mentor, Dr. Laura Markham, says kids experience bedtime like being sent to Siberia. Like that's always that always stuck with me. But I think that's true, right? That's true for a lot of kids. Like they just want to be with us. A couple of ideas. Gordon Newfeld talks about bridging the separation. We've talked about that in the in the we talked about that in, at drop off times, and it's really just any time you're going to be away from your child rather than focusing on the time that you're away. So for example, for drop-off, when you're dropping your kid off at school, rather than saying, oh, but you're going to have so much fun playing at the sand table today with your friend, you focus on when you're going to be together again. So for morning times, that might look like when I pick you up today at four, we're going to do X, Y, Z. So for nighttime, you might want to focus on the what you're going to do in the morning, right? So the next time when we're going to be together again in the morning, I'll wake you up with a snuggle or we'll read a story before you get out of bed or you know, whatever something you do in the morning that's connecting. So really just remembering that we want to try and bridge that separation for them for when they're going to be together again. There are also some other ways that that you can do this. Uh, there's a fantastic infographic that Deborah McNamara put together. She's the author of Rest, Play, Grow, which is a great book. We'll link to both the, her infographic and that book in the show notes. She's a student of, of Gordon Newfeld and really has brought a lot of his ideas to to the parenting world, but she has this beautiful infographic. And I, I know even I, I saw it ages ago and early enough to use it in some of my nighttime stuff with Maxine, with my daughter. And one thing that I used to do when she, she didn't want me to go. So we're talking about bridging the separation. 
helping them feel connected even when we're away is I would take off the shirt that I was wearing and give it to her so that she could sleep with it. And so she would have my smell. And so when we're, we're thinking about bridging the separation, it's a lot of this is, can be about the senses. So for her, it was like that sense of smell. If you're a person that wears perfume, I don't know if, if and many people do these days and there's a lot of scent sensitivities, but you could spray a little of your perfume on your kid's pillow or whatever so that they feel like they're with you. One thing we also did when Maxine was younger was she would, and she thought of this herself actually, she would like me to make noise while she was falling asleep so she could still hear me. So she would know I was still there. So she often would ask me to put on the radio in the kitchen while I was doing the dishes or she would hear the dishes. And then I would say to her when she was having a hard time with me leaving, I'd say, you'll be able to hear me downstairs doing the dishes or you'll be able to hear the radio or or you'll hear me and daddy talking. So it's just like that knowing that they're still there. What are some of the things you do with your kids for that separation bridging? So that's something that I feel we have been very successful at doing with my older son. And I talked about it a bit at the beginning, but a big thing we say to him now is, first of all, with both my children, I always say to them, I'll see you in the morning. It's the last thing we say to each other. My parents always said that to me, and it was just such a comforting statement. It's just letting you know we're always going to see each other again. And then the big thing that we do at Big C is the exact same thing as with Maxine is we'll tell him, you'll hear me in the room beside, I'm just folding laundry. A big thing I say to him now is you can hear my sewing machine because I go and I sew while he's falling asleep. So I'm like, you'll hear the machine, you'll hear and you'll know I'm just down the hallway. So that's really comforting to him. With my four-year-old, he still is at the stage where I lay in bed with him and he needs to fall asleep on me. Mm -hmm. And he just needs to feel that I'm there with him while he falls asleep. And I always tell him, I will leave when you fall asleep, but if you need me, you can always come get me. So we got him this little dinosaur. And how it works is if you tap its head, it turns onto a light. And we set up a, his old crib mattress on the ground in my bed in my bedroom with a little blanket and everything. And we let him know, your plan is if you wake up and you miss us, you turn on your little dinosaur, you can walk down the hall and you can get into that little bed. And he'll just bring his little dinosaur with him. And so that's been a way that we've been able to bridge it in a way that he has that, he knows he can be back near me again, but without it disrupting my sleep by physically, you know, getting into bed with me, which was leading to me not ever getting enough sleep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's that's a good thing. That's a, a nice little routine that you've got with him. I used to also do the, I'll check on you in five minutes, which is, I think, another good thing. If you're not you know, if you do have a child that doesn't need you to stay in the room when you fall asleep, and we're going to touch on that in a minute, because I want to talk more about the staying in the room while they fall asleep. But with my daughter, I would check on her every five minutes. She, you know, had a hard time. Out of all my kids, she was the hardest at bedtime, because she really, that connection piece, she really did not want to be separated from me. And as I said, she tucks me in now. So <laughs> there is hope for everyone. <laughs> but I would say I'll check on you in five minutes. And every five minutes, literally, I would open her door. And I would say, this worked for us. It might not work for everyone, but I would say check. And she would say, good check. And just knowing that I was going to come back every five minutes helped her to be able to fall asleep on her own. She also, this, this is something that, you know, I think helps too with kids who are, are, who feel lonely at bedtime. She still listens to audiobooks when she falls asleep. And I know that's something that might not work for everyone, but if you do have a kid that really does not want to fall asleep on their own, you might consider having like, you don't want to have them to have a device in that room necessarily, but having like a Bluetooth where you can play either like, you know, maybe a sleep story. I know there are tons of apps that have these things or an audiobook or some music. My oldest son would listen to music falling asleep. So maybe just that's, I think, a way that they don't feel so alone when they're, when they're going to bed. We actually ended up getting something called the Yodo player and It's designed so that you don't have to have a device in in the room with the child. And it is both a clock that tells you when it's wake up time and when it's sleep time. And it comes with these little cards that you put in and it plays audiobooks. Oh, cool. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes. That sounds like a neat idea. It was really, really neat. And it does come with an app. So any book that you buy for it, you do still can have on your phone. So we've played those stories in the car when we're driving as well. But it's really great because for a young person, it puts them in charge of their own device, but it's not something that they can connect to anything else. Right. It's not connected to the internet. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's a great idea. And and another thing, I think this, I think there are ideas like this in the infographic that we're going to link to that Deborah McMara's 
is the invisible string. We still actually, my daughter's 15 and she still likes me to do the invisible string when I tuck her in. And so we'll just pretend like, I'll pretend that I think we talked about it being like a golden light invisible string and I'll attach it to her chest and I'll attach it to my chest. And we just pretend there's this invisible string connecting us at night. That's really beautiful. She's so sweet. I'm so lucky. She really is. So lucky. Yeah. So just trying to think of just to wrap up the bridging the separation, trying to think of ways that your kids still feel connected to you. And there are lots of things that you will find will be your own rituals in your family, but just having that in mind that they do still need to feel connected. And just a final note on that connection piece. If you have a kid who's, you have a lot of trouble with them popping up, (laughs) popping up at bedtime, you know, keep getting out of bed and wanting you another, you know, another hug, another drink of water, another trip to the toilet. Often that's because they're just really low on connection. And so if that's something that happens a lot, think about ways in the day that you can increase the connection before bedtime and try to meet those connection needs before bedtime. And I know it's challenging for a lot of parents, you know, that are working and they've got not much time between, you know, daycare pickup and dinner and bedtime. And really you can, if you, you know, of course, special time is our gold standard in peaceful parenting. And I realize it's not realistic for a lot of people to do special time every day, but you can look at those micro moments of connection that as you and I call them, Corey, of, you mentioned it before, just using the bedtime routine itself as connection and using the play and the roughhousing as connection, but just trying to think of how can I optimize my, the hours that we have together that before bedtime to just increase that connection so that you don't get so much bedtime resistance or the, you know, the, the groundhog popping up out of bed every night. (laughs) I think the hardest time, I've heard this from a lot of parents too, for that groundhog popping up time period is when your child is kind of near the end of daycare, the year before they're going to big school and they're still having a nap. Mm -hmm. I find that's kind of the hardest time because they're little and they've been away from you and they really do need that connection. And with that nap, it sometimes makes it really hard for them to go to sleep at night. So it's that weird in-between phase. Um, So something I did in that period is, first of all, I did a lot of work at how can I be in the room with my child in a way that does not make me angry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So during that time period, I made sure I got a book light and I'd sit and read. So it was like good for me. I'd listen to podcasts. And I've said this before to parents, I even found a way where I'd bring my yoga mat in and just do like gentle yoga that was not like causing a scene to distract them. But just finding ways that if they really needed me in that room, and that was the only way that I could keep him in bed, what can I do so that I'm in there? And it's pleasant for me. And at that time, I also did what I could to talk to daycare to see is there a way for you to not have my child nap anymore? Or a shorter nap. But I've heard that that is not always possible depending on where you live. Yeah, there are some states that have mandated nap times through, I think through oh, until they turn five, which is depending on your schedule, that can be pretty late for a pretty late age for a nap. My kids were all done napping by the time they turned three. So that can be really challenging for parents. So let's talk about that because you know, you're right that popping up at bedtime often is because kids need more support to stay in bed. And so a way, and and I, I mean, you know this about me because we've talked about it. I sat with my kids until they fell asleep uh, for years. And uh, honestly, I never got more reading done. And then in those time periods, because I had a book light, this was before there were phones. So I couldn't like, you know, listen to podcasts or whatever, but I had an actually literal like light that lit up the book, the paper book that I was reading. It's easier. I have one too. I love it. Yeah, nice. And um, so I would just sit and read in the room. And if they tried to talk to me, I would say, shh, I can only stay if you're still in quiet. That was my line. I can only stay if you're still in quiet. So if they're like talking or moving around a lot, I would, you know, occasionally I'd have to like start to stand up and move towards the door. And then they say, no, 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 I'll be still in quiet. And um, so that was our deal. They were still in quiet. I would stay in the room until they fell asleep. And yeah, do something that, you know, listen to a podcast, read a book, you know, catch up on your work emails if you have to, but just find a way that, as you said, (laughs) you can stay there without feeling angry and resentful. And that's a game changer, I think, for a lot of parents. The other thing that helped with that for me is giving my child a container of time to talk. Oh, I love that. Yes. So this is so obviously my children are chatty because look at me, 
So clearly they have a lot to say. <laughs> so what, and you know what? Bedtime is the time when they feel ready. It's an easier time to talk because it's dark. You're side by side. That's when your kids are thinking about everything that happened that day. So I think it's really natural that that's when they all of a sudden are like, let me tell you in detail exactly what happened at recess. Yeah. So what I have to do, especially with my four-year-old who takes after me very intensely is tell him, okay, we have five minutes to talk as much as you want. After that, we have to be still and quiet. And so we've been really working on that. And that really helps because he feels like he can get it all out. And then he's like, okay, now I, now I can be quiet. Yeah. And I have heard some families who even call it like talk time or chat time or something like that, where you've got that time, you set it, but you do, you make it a container for it. You have a certain amount of time, five minutes, 10 minutes where you're having that talk time. And then after that, it's still in quiet. And, and you're right. So many beautiful moments happen in that, you know, lying with at bedtime and they, you know, feel like it's dark, it's quiet, you feel connected. And that is a really special time of the day. And, you know, another thing I wanted to say in in this podcast that we're talking about today is I hear a lot of parents who guiltily say, I'm still lying with my child to fall asleep. And there's nothing to feel bad about that. Like if it's working for you and it's working for your child, it's, it's lovely. And there's, there's nothing wrong with lying with your child until they fall asleep. As we mentioned at the beginning, you're setting them up for independence by meeting their needs for connection when they're younger. And if you like it and they like it, that's great. And, you know, even if they're older and you still want to lie with them while they're falling asleep, if it works for you, that's wonderful. I read in our Facebook group once a mother that had teenagers being like, I'm still able to do this with my children. And of course it looks very different than when they were little, but this is what has made the teen years easy Mm -hmm. because we have this time when we both feel safe to talk about really important and tough things. Mm -hmm. So instead of looking at this as a, you know, bad habit, you're looking at this as nurturing that relationship and giving yourselves an assigned time each day where you can really get through all the things you need to talk about. Love that. Yeah. And um, I also think that sometimes if you do, if you have a kid who's super chatty and you're gone past your, you know, five or 10 minutes telling them, you know, we, you can all answer that in the morning. Like sometimes you'll, you'll get the question or the, I really have to tell you something. We can talk about that in the morning. It's time to go to sleep. And sometimes they'll say they'll, that they'll forget, but I'm going to forget. And so you could offer to like write it down or make a note in your phone or whatever about what it is that they wanted to tell you about. That happened to me last night. It's always when we're coming to the end of the, of the, of the talk time where my four-year-old's like, can you tell me exactly how quicksand works? <laughs> you know? They always come up with the most hilarious things that they think of that they want to talk about. Oh, it's so funny. You know, one thing I wanted to note about the lying, you know, staying with kids while they fall asleep is sometimes it can contribute to night wakings. You know, you've probably heard this before, but, you know, we get we get we have sleep associations where if our association is I fall asleep with mom or dad lying next to me, it can be hard when they wake up in the middle of the night and they don't know how to put themselves back to sleep yet. Like when they're littler, because that actually is a skill. And I think a lot of us don't realize how many times we we wake up in the night and put ourselves back to sleep. So, you know, if that is the case, if you're staying with your child while they fall asleep and you do notice there's some night wakings, you might experiment with just leaving when they're really sleepy and not so that they're conscious that you're, that you're leaving them when they're awake and you can still do that. I'll check on you and all of the other things that we've talked about. But if you are having those night wakings, you know, maybe to consider leaving when they're not quite asleep. And then the other thing is uh, with the night wakings, and we I went over this in detail in episode 65, which was a coaching call with Liz, where I talked about coaching your child to put themselves back to sleep at night. So that was something I did with my kids, which was basically like, when you wake up in the night, and you, you know, you look around, and it's still dark, and it's time to go back to sleep, take your blanket, you know, pull it up over your shoulders, grab your stuffy, and roll over and go back to sleep. And I would remind them of that. And when I would leave them and say, okay, what are you going to do if you wake up in the night? And they would say, roll back to sleep. That's how it got shortened to, you know, pull up your blanket, roll over and go back to sleep. So that's also something that you can do, you know, if you do have a child that wakes up in the night. And I love what you said, Corey, though, about having that bed on the floor, uh, where if they do wake up and they need you, 
and I would even add to what you said about, you know, pretend you're a little bunny and come in so quietly or a little mouse and you surprise me, you know, make that, you know, I'll be surprised when I wake up in the morning and I see you there. So that to encourage them to come in quietly. Yeah, that's such a good idea. I think that comes back to the idea is we think that whatever is happening right now is going to happen forever. And just knowing that anything with sleep, you can always change. So I chose to co-sleep with my four-year-old for a really, really long time. And I would, you know, when he came and got me in the middle of the night, I would go back and sleep with him. But there was a point when I realized that this wasn't working for me anymore. And so we gently changed it. And it's just having that confidence that would do what is working for you, what gives you the most sleep. And then if at any point it's not giving you enough sleep anymore, it's okay to find a new gentle approach. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, I, I, so many parents that we coach, you know, maybe they're going through like a tough time or a transition and their kid was an independent sleeper and now they want to sleep with them or sleep on their floor. And they're so afraid to let that happen because they're like, I don't want to create any bad habits. There's no such thing as a permanent habit. Like you can always change it. And, you know, you need to do, as you said, you need to do whatever gets the most sleep for you and your family because sleep is so important. Like if we're low on sleep, we are grouchy and we can't be the parents that we want to be when we're exhausted, right? So don't worry about bad habits. You know, I, I, we don't, you and I don't have a position on co-sleeping or independent sleep and we don't think one is better than the other, whatever works for your family. But if there is a time where you, you know, you're working with the bed on the floor or letting someone sleep with you, don't worry. You can always change it later. And the older kids get, the easier it is to make changes because they have more rationality and logic and they can understand things better. It's true. And I've realized too that even with my my seven-year-old, he'll tell me when he's going through a transition that he just needs me a bit more to lay with him. And so we'll go back to me laying with him, even just for five minutes while he's laying there in bed. And the second we've gotten through that transition, like going back to school this week, suddenly he won't ask anymore. So you just have to have that trust that like, if you meet the need, they will be able to pull back when they're ready. Yeah. Like even, even now I'm going away tomorrow for a week with my husband and leaving the kids at home. And if anyone sees any parties, tell us, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) They're not not going to do that. Our neighbors are all too close. They know they could never get away with having more people over than they're allowed. But my daughter's feeling really sad and nervous about me going away for a week because I mentioned we're really attached. And so she said, Mama, will you sleep with me tomorrow night, the night before we go? And I said, sure, I'll sleep with you. And then last night, tonight's the night that I'm going to sleep with her. But last night, I, she was feeling sad. And I'm just so, I'm going to miss you so much. And I said, do you want me to sleep with you tonight too? And she's like, no, <laughs> just tomorrow night. <laughs> but, you know, she's, she, she knows that'll be helpful for her. And it's just that one night, it doesn't mean it's every night. Is there anything that you feel that we haven't, I, that we haven't covered? The one thing that I'm just realizing we didn't mention is if you do have a partner, how important it is to maybe take turns. Yes. And putting the kids to bed. Yes, because it it really can be it can be a real burden if you're the only one who can put them to bed. And you know, I mean, we've had this come up in our membership when parents say, "But but my kid wants me to put them to bed." It it's okay if you if they have the other parent the not preferred parent put them to bed and they're unhappy about it. It's okay if they're unhappy. Like that's sometimes, you know, that can be good for them. I remember, I just remember this story. When my oldest son was about 18 months old, I was the only one who could put him to bed. And it was really wearing on me. Like I was just getting really exhausted from, you know, you fall asleep and then you need to get back up and, you know, your whole night is thrown off. And so my husband and I decided that he would try and put him, he would start putting him to bed. And, you know, you can do the every other night thing. But the first night he was, my son was screaming, mama, mama, mama. And I was out in the living room and with hindsight, maybe I should have like gone for a walk or something, but I was out in the living room and it was just so hard. And my husband was really like, I knew he could handle it. It wasn't, I wasn't worried about that, but I just knew that my son was so upset and, and I could just open that door and end his distress. Right. But I also knew this is really important that I, that I don't, um, you know, just give into this. So I called my dad. My dad has always been a really great parenting support. And my dad said, do not go in there. (laughs) He needs to know. And this is something that I hadn't thought about it this way. He needs to know that his dad is there for him as well as you. And I was like, thank you. Like that makes so much sense that like he, you know, when, when we 
let our partners, I don't mean let, but like when we let our partners take over some of these things that our kids prefer that we do, it's sending a real clear message to them that you have two parents who are there to support you, who also love you. And, you know, they're also there for you in hard times. That is such a good story because I know I have felt that way. And what I've seen is that the bond now that, you know, my children have with my husband, because I have been the the partner that is at home more. So they've definitely spent more time with me, but being able to, to really just, I go for a walk with my husband, (laughs) when my husband would put my older child to sleep. And now he really can be put to bed by either of us. My younger one, we're still working through that process, but it is really great because it's good for them to know that they have multiple people that they can rely on and that are there for them and that they have a close connection with. Yeah. And if you, you know, if your partner has a tough time and doesn't know what to say when the kid's like, mama, mama, or whatever, if we're, if it, if it's working out that way, a good thing to coach your partner on is just to empathize and say, I know you wish that your mom could put you to bed every night. You love your mom so much. You know, I love your mom too. And I'm here for you. I'm your dad. If we're talking about a heterosexual couple, I'm your dad and I love you and I'm here for you also. I'm going to put you to bed tonight. Mommy will put you to bed tomorrow night. Yeah, that's the perfect way to say it. Yeah. Can be tough. Like we just want to end their end their suffering, right? Well, it's, it's true. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. This has been great. Thank you for having me on again. I love being able to come and talk to all of our listeners. Yeah, it's so great. Should we put together a cheat sheet for this? Sure. Okay. Put together a cheat sheet. Okay. So if you want the cheat sheet of the tips that we mentioned, you can go to sarahrosensweet.com slash bedtime. So sarahrosensweet.com slash bedtime, and we'll put together a cheat sheet that lists out a lot of these tips that we've talked about today. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.